All right, so I named the presentation um, The Mushroom with a Story. Basically, we're going to cover the ways in which um, a particular type of mushroom actually ties in with our holiday um, celebrations, particularly around the winter solstice, and kind of how this mushroom ties into this whole Christmas story. And so the mushroom is featured in a lot of fairy tales. Um, it's in popular culture, many movies, TV shows. It's the Mario mushroom on your iPhone. It's the mushroom emoji. And it really is the most iconic mushroom and the most widely recognized mushroom. When you think of mushrooms, it's probably one of the first mushrooms you think of. Or when you go to draw a mushroom, you're probably going to draw something similar to this. This red and white mushroom. So, like, if you've ever seen it outside, it has warts on it. It's a very bright red color. It's really easy to see along, like, green trees. And <clears throat> it somehow made its way into our holiday decorations. You'll often see them pictured with, you know, the pine trees, with the reindeer. Um, it'll be next to Santa Claus. And this is really nothing new. Um, if you even go back to more older decorations, the mushroom can be very focused in two different pictures. And sometimes they even take on like a persona. They have faces. Um, in this one, they're kind of walking into someone's houses. They're carrying branches. Sometimes they're very heavily focused on the mushroom. And so we will see elves bringing them places. Um, in this other one, there's even a house that takes on the shape of the mushroom. They're sitting on the mushroom, using it as a table. And it's, all the, it's obviously all the same mushroom. It's never depicted anything else. It's not a mistake that they're using this particular mushroom. So more mushroom houses, you know, people enjoying the mushroom, you know, jumping over it, happy around it. And so what is this mushroom? Because it's a real species of mushroom. It's called the Amanita muscaria. The common name is the fly agaric. Um, it got this name because people actually use it as an insecticide. So people would chop up the mushroom and put it in bowls of milk and it would attract and then kill flies. <clears throat> and it's an ectomycorrhizal mushroom, meaning it forms relationships or symbiosis, particularly with pine trees and spruce, but sometimes birches, cedar and fir trees. And if we look below, this is a really good picture of what this relationship looks like. So just how trees have roots, the mushroom has mycelium, and through this connection, um, the mycelium is actually able to penetrate the roots growing from the tips of the roots and extending them to make a whole network. Um, there's even an image of how you would see it under a microscope, and so they're literally growing right into each other, and it connects the mushroom and the tree and so usually you'll find the mushroom right under the tree or if not it'll be very close by to these particular species of trees and so it's native to the boreal forests of the northern hemisphere we don't really get it so much on the east coast we get a different variation that has these yellowish colors sometimes orange but it's very um, closely related um, and you'll mostly see this red and white mushroom farther up north, um, all over Europe. It's very widely distributed across the world. And the ecology um, of this mushroom kind of gives us the colors that are primarily, primarily used in Christmas. So the green from the tree, the red and white from the mushroom. And so the chemical perspective is important to note um, because this mushroom is consumed and it's consumed for its chemical makeup. It's a toxic mushroom and most people know that this is a poisonous mushroom um, or to kind of avoid the whole family of Amanitas, but it really has um, two compounds that you're gonna get if you were to ever ingest this mushroom. Um, the two chemical compounds that people mostly focus on are muscimol and ibotenic acid. And these are two compounds that affect um, serotonin and dopamine levels. So 
Those are obviously chemical messengers in the brain that, you know, deal with emotions and consciousness. And so this makes the mushroom a psychoactive mushroom. And like I said, it is a toxic mushroom, but recent studies have shown it isn't as toxic as we once thought. And this research was kind of done and is important because we know that people have um, consumed this mushroom all throughout time. And so when you consume this mushroom, um, it's an interesting process because it's not really broken down like other things are. Um, part of the compounds are sent directly to your brain and the other part is metabolized um, or gets excre excreted to your body without being metabolized very quickly, meaning that um, all the compounds that you consumed are actually still in your urine. So in a more simpler terms, your urine contains all the psychoactive properties um, once it's excreted from your body. And that kind of comes into play uh, later in the story. And so that's the mushroom. That's where it's found in nature. That's kind of the chemical makeup. That's kind of who we're talking about. But when and why do we use this mushroom? It's often used in the winter solstice. And in plain terms, the winter solstice um, kind of takes place on December 21st. Um, sometimes it can be a day or um, two head or back, but at that time, half of the earth becomes the farthest away from the sun, and it's the shortest day of the year and the longest night of the year. And every day after that, uh, the days become longer and longer until the summer solstice. And it really has represented this time of death and rebirth, particularly of the sun. So, you know, the winter comes and everything is getting dark, um, but eventually the sun comes back. And so it represents a uh, time of renewal and celebrations take place, rituals and ceremonies. And there's this really good quote I found that kind of sums up this time. It says, cultures have celebrated the winter solstice into antiquity the darkness seeming to engulf the land as a weakened sun struggles to light ever shorter days. Life seems precarious, the abyss near. Then the light returns, the sun reborn for another year, an endless cycle. Many of the symbols of early solstice celebrations remain with us today. So basically what this says, you know, the abyss is near. It's seen as a very dark time, but obviously people had this um, time happen again and again, and they knew that the sun would come back. So it really started to represent, again, this death and rebirth. Um, and people celebrated this time because even though the winter comes, um, it does disappear and the cycle continues again and again. And so the mushroom is an entheogen. An entheogen is a substance um, that people use um, across different cultures. And so the Amanita muscaria, this red and white mushroom, has been a central part of these celebrations and ceremonies, um, mostly in Northern Europe and Asia, but also in Canada. And it can date back as far as 4,000 years ago. And this term was developed by a group of scholars of um, mythology and ethnobotanists, um, when they were kind of studying why people use this mushroom and how it's used. And they found that it was used mostly in religious or cultural, um, traditional um, settings. And so they wanted a word for different plants or mushrooms that have this big role in culture. And so the main reasons why groups use this mushroom are for sacred and magic activities, which is kind of what we're talking about today but they also are used in recitals of epics and singing and um, during physical effort, um, hard work, um, and before heroic actions. The mushroom can give feelings of becoming very powerful or energetic. So sometimes they're used um, before doing something with a lot of, like that's gonna take a lot of energy. But some of the sacred and magical activities that would take place during the winter solstice um, that would be used during um, ceremonies with this mushroom are to communicate with souls of the dead, healing and treating ailments, overcoming obstacles or figure out why something has happened, interpretation of dreams, foretelling the future, seeing the past, 
in visiting other places or worlds, also known as soul flight. Um, and that's um, a really big part of this mushroom. This picture we have here is actually of a seventh generation shaman um, of the Tungus tribe in Siberia. This is a more newer picture, but um, she is obviously carrying on the rituals of her tribe. Um, and we'll see that Siberia is one of the um, main places that this mushroom was used. And a shaman really is just a healer or someone that people go to to help them with all these different um, sacred activities. <clears throat> and so what is soul flight shamanism? Well, this is a real central part to the use of the Amanita muscaria and across the groups that use them. So many groups in Asia, um, and again, Siberia, they see the universe as three parts that are all interconnected. So heaven above, the earth in the middle, and hell below. And this isn't obviously the only picture that, you know, depicts this type of um, universe, but it's a really good one because it kind of shows how the tree is the central path. And there's many other ways to get around to these other planes of the earth, if you will. You know, there's the main tree that connects everything. There's all these little paths. Um, the branches, I feel like, represent more paths. And basically, the way people view this idea of the earth, um, it's something that is able to be traveled across. And that's why it's connected. Um, they're all connected so you can get to each level. And it's through this path that the soul of the shaman is actually able to travel during their journeys after they've taken the mushroom, because this is a psychoactive mushroom. So it obviously does have a large effect on the brain and your consciousness after you've taken it. And the shamans really take this mushroom and go on this journey to bring back knowledge, advice, wisdom. If people come to them and are looking to say, communicate with the dead or to heal a particular illness um, or they have questions they kind of will ask the shaman or tell the shaman you know what is going on and then it's kind of the shaman's role to go on this journey and kind of bring back um, guidance or advice and so who are some of the groups that use this mushroom there's tons of them, but I just picked like three main um, tribes that are known to use this mushroom. And this research regarding the Amanita muscaria and this holiday story, these are kind of the main ones that people look at or talk about. So the Sami, uh, they're near the North Pole or, you know, the modern day area of um, northern Norway, Sweden, and Finland. And this is you know, really where a lot of people, if we're talking about the Christmas story, where Santa Claus is from, the North Pole. And so it kind of is interesting that a group of people um, in that area are using this mushroom. And some particular beliefs that they had um, were that when the shaman took the mushroom, they actually ended up looking like the mushroom. So they would see, um, you know, this red, large character um, and sometimes the mush or the shamans would actually dress up like the mushrooms during the ceremonies to represent them. Uh, the shamans would travel on sleighs led by reindeer, and they would often visit people um, traveling this way to conduct the ceremonies. And again, uh, they were taking the mushroom to bring back this guidance and knowledge and were often rewarded with food. Another big group is the Koryaks, so they're in northeast Siberia, and their tribe name, the Koryaks, actually translates to with the reindeer. So again, reindeer have a really large connection with this mushroom, um, and the people also had a very important uh, relationship with the reindeer. And so around the 17th century, um, or actually, sorry, the 18th century, there were people traveling to Siberia, and they were really shocked when they discovered um, that these people were using the mushroom, especially in these ceremonial contexts. And there was a Swedish colonel who wrote a whole book detailing the mushroom-eating habitats of the Koryak people. 
And so throughout times, uh, dating back to ancient times, you know, 4,000 years plus, um, these people were consuming the mushrooms spiritually and recreationally. They dried the mushrooms. Um, they would dry as many as they could. Um, but sometimes those without a supply actually resorted to dire measures of drinking muscaria infused urine. So that kind of ties into it. The chemistry people somehow um, figured out that either the urine of people who had eaten the mushrooms could be consumed or the urine of reindeer who had eaten the mushroom. Because once the mushroom passes through the body, a lot um, of the toxic properties are removed and thus making it a more pleasant experience when you actually want to embark on that. And so mushroom hunters were really cautious when collecting these mushrooms um, because reindeer loved them too and would literally charge into fields of mushrooms or if they could smell like the mushroom on you they would charge at you. And so the reindeer really had a relationship with the mushroom as well as the people. And the Conti, so these are, this is a group in Western Siberia. Um, they have an interesting use of the mushroom because often a lot of the other groups, only men could use um, the mushroom or only men were shamans. But in the Conti, it was heavily um, recorded that women were also able to be shamans. Um, and they used the mushroom to connect with the spirit realm, to perform uh, divination, which is seeking knowledge. Um, to it and to even alleviate boredom on long winter nights. So also just doing them recreationally um, in the winter. And this mushroom often appears um, the days leading up to the winter solstice. So it comes kind of at this time and people use it when it arrives. They also report that the appearance of the spirits that they see while taking the mushroom sometimes actually look like an an actual mushroom they actually see mushroom people when they take this mushroom and they say that they are playful that they sometimes play jokes um, but they can also be very serious and they demand that you respect them while you're there on that journey or your life would be in danger like elves. yeah kind of like elves and we have this picture where um i thought was a pretty good representation because we're seeing these little mushroom people and there's a bunch of them and they have a light like they're guiding you and so it's these spirits that kind of bring the user to different worlds and they believe that it was these mushroom people that would show them the visions uh, they were also reindeer herders um, and they used dried amanita to keep up with the herd so again kind of gives you a lot of energy and so what does all this use of the mushroom um, have to do with the modern world celebrations of this time and really the Christmas story? So the Christmas story, I mean, you can't really get away from it. Not everyone celebrates Christmas, but when you live um, in the modern world, you know, you go out, every store has Christmas decorations, um, usually in the center of towns and cities. You know, a lot of people celebrate Christmas as it's very you know, it's just there every year. And there's some main elements that are always there. I mean, we have traditions surrounding this time. Um, we bring in pine trees into our house and decorate them. We put presents under the tree. We hang stockings above the fire. Um, and then we have this whole story of Santa Claus, a guy who travels on a sleigh with reindeer and brings presents. I don't think many of us ever really question why we're doing these things or how they kind of came to be. But the mushroom and these ceremonies can kind of help explain maybe a connection. And so the mushroom in the tree, as we talked about, primarily pine trees have this mycorrhizal relationship. And so they are connected forever. And so I don't think it's a mistake that we're bringing in pine trees and also using, again, the colors of the ecology, the red and white mushroom. Red and white and green are the most used colors during the holiday. In the past, um, people who had this mushroom would often dry it on the tree. And so in this picture, we can see it perfectly. People would hang the mushroom on pine trees to dry them out. 
because the drying of the mushroom reduces the toxicity of them um, greatly and so that they can consume them um, with better effect. And so this kind of can represent or kind of give way to why we decorate trees or to me um, and a lot of other people, it, they look like ornaments. Presence under the tree can also symbolize the sacred mushroom that only grows beneath that type of tree. Um, as well as hanging them on the tree, people also hung them in stockings above the fire to dry out. So we can kind of see how these actions um, have a connection. And who is bringing the gifts? Well, like we talked about, the shamans would collect these large amounts of mushrooms um, to deliver to them, to deliver to people and to use during these ceremonies. Um, they were often rewarded with food. Um, and this kind of echoes the modern act of leaving out milk and cookies for Santa Claus or the person who brings you presents. Um, often the front doors of houses would be blocked off by snow. So the shamans coming to bring mushrooms would often have to go through the chimney. And so again, someone is bringing you gifts through a chimney you know why are these things happening or you know why do we tell that story well it kind of remnants um or relates to how um shamans would actually pass out this mushroom in the past so there are some reports that again the shamans dressed up in red and white to represent the mushroom so that could tell you a little bit why maybe santa claus wears these colors um, and in the ceremony, you know, shamans would give a lot of insight um, and guidance to people, which wasn't a physical present that we give today, but it was a type of gift giving um, because people were really relying on the shamans or relying on the mushroom to help them um, during this time or help them with different challenges they were facing. And then the whole flying reindeers thing, you know, reindeers are reported to love Almanina muscaria. It's a large source of their food. Um, and of course, we can't really know how the reindeer are affected by the mushroom, but they do act differently after they've consumed the mushrooms. Um, people report them prancing and jumping around after they've eaten the mushroom. Um, and we have kind of con we have kind of assumed that the reindeer are also feeling these effects once they eat the mushroom. And maybe they are repeatedly um, ingesting the mushrooms for that purpose. And again, um, drying the almanita was a pretty good way of reducing the toxicity, but people also did witness the reindeer drinking their own urine. And that is something that they began to do and learned that um, that was another way to consume the mushroom. Um, in a safer way. And so reindeer are kind of forever or permanently connected to the mushroom in that way and then connected to the people um, in these traditional uses. Some even go as far to say that Rudolph, why he has a red nose, mostly because he loves eating the red um, mushroom. And soul flight shamanism is kind of how people take flight. Um, but People would also describe the reindeer as taking flight, especially when they would kind of act out after eating the mushroom. And so, I mean, I don't think any of this is really um, a coincidence. And a lot of people have done a lot of research on this. And there's key aspects that are repeated in symbolicism that is just, it's just there. Um, and I think it really shows the power of storytelling and how you know this isn't concrete scientific evidence we can't really look at something like this because we're talking about culture but these stories and these traditions um haven't really found their way into the future um in the exact same way like we don't take the omni muscaria in this way but we do um include its imagery all over our decorations and so parts of the traditions of the past have um you know survived and all this information is you know hands-on experiences of people and that is how they use the mushroom and that's why it has stuck around because it is a very significant mushroom with a lot of history to it really 
And obviously it's just a misunderstood mushroom. Like I said, everyone thinks it's just a toxic mushroom, but there is a reason why we continue to celebrate it. Um, and learning about it can really provide this valuable insight. And so these are some of my sources, um, different papers people have written and different talks and stuff like that. So there's really no studies on like, dosing with Amanda Muscarium? So that's why a lot of people, like it's not a commonly digested mushrooms because there's really no background in the scientific studies. It's a lot of like just reports from people like in some of the research I was doing listening to some of these um, people who still are carrying on the traditions of their tribe like they have their own ways like they'll say you know you can take one to two dried caps before mm -hmm. you're starting to get to like uncomfortable you know so they have their own ways of dosing it they also really prefer mushrooms that have not fully opened up um that are still really small and so you know people have probably written about it it's probably in some type of literature but the dosing i'm not aware of a paper that like yeah. dives into it um but yeah i'm also it's really interesting like the whole the drying versus drinking the urine like it actually is it's really interesting that for some reason once this mushroom passes through a body it's it's able to be consumed without i mean you may have a bad experience but you're not gonna like you're not gonna die at that point so yeah the body most run this spot as a that kind of makes sense with like even forage mushrooms it's like it's being processed through your body it's being kind of broken down or heated up kind of like other mushrooms that need to be called like culinary mushrooms they need to be heated or cooked before they even be able to digest properly yeah like actually i think it's like it's somewhere i think in europe but um some people like eating this mushroom they say if you boil it for a really long time and then like fry it or something it's delicious and they have no problem eating it so i mean yeah and they don't get effects from that it's like i don't know i didn't it didn't it didn't say anything about if it was still psychoactive they just said it was delicious and that they like to eat it i always wondered that about other psychoactives Well, sometimes heat will actually probably, I mean, like, if you think about psilocybin mushrooms, they say heat is not good. Heat destroys a lot. Sometimes it's not a significant amount, but it does impact the potency in that sense. So, Same with, like, THC. You probably cook that stuff at, like, such a high temperature. That's really interesting what you said, though, about the temperature of your body. I, I wonder if that does have anything to yeah, do with it. Any other holidays? Not that I can. Uh, not really any other holidays. Like I said earlier, like I think the Amanita is also used in some Easter decorations. I've noticed, but that may just be the whole like fairy tale folklore type of thing. Um, there is more. Yeah, I don't know. There is a more like I feel like. It's, it's a real big topic. It might be like sensitive to someone, but there is this whole research about in part, sometimes the Amanita muscaria, but more so um, psilocybin mushrooms, how that connects to Jesus. And so obviously Jesus connects to Christmas, I think like obviously Easter too. So more holidays, but I mean, I've read research where they literally say Jesus is just, is supposed to be he's not a person he's an experience from psychedelic mushrooms all stuff like that um some of these guys we were talking about earlier i think it's um 
I think it's Wasson, Gordon Wasson. He wrote a whole book of how he thinks this Omnia muscaria um, is this ancient drink that they used to um, have in India known as Soma. Um, so, I mean, all sorts of stuff. I mean, um, ethnomycology, the, the study of, you know, mushrooms and culture, there's a bunch of really cool theories because, um, you know, mushrooms were like, not only this mushroom, like this is an interesting mushroom that's being used in ceremonial context. It's not as much talked about, but psilocybin mushrooms have been used in tons of, um, ceremonies dating way back, especially like in Mexico. Um, so, I mean, real big history with the use of mushrooms um, for these reasons. Are you convinced? Is this a convincing story, or is it, or is it just, is it just a coincidence? Or, um, I mean, it's not necessarily something that I need to be convinced of. It's more of just celebrating the folklore. I mean, it's something yeah. that's going to be very prominent into the folklore and into the future because it has so much in the past. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, it explains a lot of the symbology wrapped around Christmas and around all like the uh, the fairy tale portrayed here, even. Like the gnomes, yeah. the elves, Santa Claus, the reindeer. Yeah, they could be the first time. Yeah. Then, yeah, from the inside. Sure. It's pretty convincing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll end this celebration with an up close of some of our decorations, our host, Aaron, and of course. Is anyone on the live right now? Oh, hello. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>